Hi, and welcome to this lecture on physical sciences, which is one of the sub-strands out of the Australian curriculum science within the strand of science understanding. So we'll be covering those topics that you can see there. But before we begin, we need to get um, some equipment for today. So just like in previous lectures where I don't recommend that you have this lecture playing on the in the background while you're walking the dog, on the treadmill, cooking, looking after children. And the reason is so, not firstly, so that you can focus on the lecture, but secondly, sometimes there are actually activities for you to do. So today, there are some demonstrations that we're gonna practice later on, and they require some equipment. So get two balls, yeah, it doesn't matter what size balls they are. What's important is the size difference and also the mass difference. So we've got Eddie, the electron, standing for a tennis ball here. And the second, third piece that you'll need is just bits of scrap paper. So I just went to a recycling bin and I fished these out of the recycling bin, okay? So it's not important that you actually have fresh, clean paper for the demonstrations later on, okay? So I won't read the learning objectives to you, but they're here. And if you so wish, you may pause the video and read those. So just like how you will be required when you're a teacher to display your learning objectives. Here are the learning objectives for this lecture. Okay. Let's keep going. So why are we bothering to study content and who has determined the content that we'll actually have a look at? So when you have a look at the Australian Curriculum Science, the Australian Curriculum Science is broken down into three strands, science understanding, then we've got science as a human endeavour and science inquiry skills. The focus of these content lectures is all around science understanding. Within the science understanding strand, there are four substrands. There's physical sciences, which we'll be doing today, biological, chemical, earth and space sciences. So the traditional sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, geology and astronomy, have been split up and divided in that manner. Now, one of the key skills that you'll need as a teacher is to be able to read these content descriptor statements and decide what is the piece of content that is being addressed in this statement. So if you'd like to have a go, go ahead and pause the video at this point and see if you can highlight the important concepts, important scientific concepts, which are addressed in each year level and then come back and join us and see how you go, okay? Radio. So I've gone through that activity myself and what I've done is I've highlighted in red what I thought to be the key concepts in each of these levels. So in year seven, we're looking at unbalanced forces. Now to me, that's a code way of saying, oh, we're gonna talk about Newton's three laws. Not only are we talking about Newton's three laws, but also gravity. In year eight, we're broadening the view uh, of physics um, and we're looking at different types of energy. Okay? Um, so we'll be covering that today. In year nine, we up the ante, we talk about energy transfers and transformations, and then we look at one of the key models, the key, one of the key ways that we think about energy, that is the wave and particle models. Then in year 10, we're talking about energy conservation in terms of energy transfers and transformations, and also the motion of objects, okay? So in year 10, we're talking about energy conservation and also kinetics. And so we'll be covering all of this material in this lecture today, okay? Radio. so the reason why there is no textbook for the course is because we live in a time where you personally have at your fingertips access to the sum total of human knowledge, which is, you know, far exceeds any amount of information that any other humans in history have had access to. Now, in, t in, in regard to that, YouTube is going to be one of your best friends in terms of getting access to high quality content. Not only high quality content, but also it's scientifically accurate and also excellent production views. So teachers all around the world, they could go themselves and make videos like this about the of Newton's three laws, but there are actually professionals out there in the world who actually have done this work for free and have posted this to YouTube, okay? So I strongly recommend that you dig deeply 
into the, into the library that is YouTube and you use all of the videos that we, I present in these videos to help give you a starting point because while there's lots of quality out there there's also lots of garbage and so what I've done is I've reviewed what I have thought to be the best of the best and I've included those here and so you can use these as starting points for multimodal text that you would use with your students okay so what I'd like you to do is to watch this video and have a think about this learning objective, explain phenomena using Newton's three laws of motion. So in this video, it actually covers what Newton's three laws are, and then we'll actually come back and talk about that. So okay. We, so, now, within physics, there are many, many, many misconceptions when it actually comes to motion. So what I provided here is some excellent uh, videos that you can use to help bring you up to speed in terms of misconceptions because this is going to be one of the constant challenges that you'll have in your classroom is that students will bring with them to your classroom naive conceptions of how the world works. Um, so for example, when I was a child, I had the view that uh, Inside you, you had a food for hot, cold, uh, hot food and a tube for cold food. Um, so that was a misconception that I actually brought with me from growing up into the classroom. So there are many misconceptions in physics that you also need to wrap your head around so you can directly address those. Now, what we know from the literature is that just telling somebody that they are wrong or that their misconception is wrong is not effective, okay? And so what we try and do is in the sciences and especially science education is, is use a technique what we call discrepant events. These are dis demonstrations of physical laws and properties or just things generally scientifically that once presented will help, ch help the uh, the, the student challenge their naive preconceptions of how that phenomenon works, okay? Now, the teaching strategy that you would actually usually pair that up with is the POE, okay? Now, POE has other varieties, so I've also heard PEE, -E, there's POEE, -E. there's a whole range of different ways of thinking about this type of teaching strategy. So the POE stands for prediction. So before you do the demonstration, students make a prediction of what's gonna happen. Then you perform the demonstration. So students just describe their observations. And then students then explain their observations, okay? And then hopefully it's through this process that students come to replace their prior conception, which may be incorrect, with a proper uh, up-to-date conception, okay? Now, because of the recording facilities that we're in and it's hard to move the camera, I'm gonna leave these demonstrations up to you, okay? So, in the first demonstration, you're going to drop the, the two balls, okay? So now it's important here that you don't drop them like this, yeah? That's not a good starting position. That's probably a better starting position. And you also don't want to release one before the other, okay? So go ahead and do that. So before you drop them, make, uh, make a prediction about which you think is gonna hit the ground first. Then write what your observations are. Now your observations may be um, the, the sound that the ball makes. The observation might be which ball hit the ground first as your observation, okay? And so from that, see if you can come up with an explanation based upon your observations, okay? So that is the first POE. The next one is the tennis ball, yeah? And you get your piece of paper and you just scrunch it up. And in this case, you try and get them the same size, yeah? Okay. So then what you're doing is removing the variable of size, but you've still got the mass difference and then and then what you've got is then you vary another variable, in this case, the surface area of the piece of paper, 
and you go through that same process, okay? So this is a good way to help students overcome prior conceptions, okay? Excellent, so do, that, do those demonstrations, collect your data, and if your course has a session where we can actually talk about these, bring, bring this table to that session where we can talk about things. So as I was saying earlier about how YouTube is just a wealth of resources, Here's another video. So all the videos that are in this PowerPoint, uh, sorry, all the PowerPoints that are in this course will be in the team site. So please go ahead and, and have a look for those. So this is a great demo, this is a great piece of video and it's actually from the moon landing because before they went to the moon, there was a, a, a classical riddle going around. If we we're on the moon and we dropped a hammer and a feather, which would hit the ground first? Now, science has an answer, but here, in the, here on Earth, with the things like an atmosphere and air resistance, the answer is different to what science says. So they repeated that very same experiment on the moon, and they've got video footage of it. Okay? Um, so here's another classic uh, demonstration of that concept. So, so here, um, the, so this is uh, Professor Brian Cox. So they went into a great big vacuum room and they got a, literally a bowling ball and an ostrich feather and they dropped them from the top of this dome and they collected their data. So if you haven't seen this video before, go ahead, make a prediction about whether the bowling ball or the um, ostrich feather is going to hit the ground first. Watch the video, collect your data and see if you can puzzle through why uh, you observed what you observed, okay? In terms of the explanation itself, this is a link to another video, this time by Veritasium, by um, Derek um, and Derek Muller, and he provides a really, really good de um, explanation of why the objects actually hit the ground at the same time. So there's gonna be a lot of pausing in this video, in this lecture, as you jump out of here and go and watch the video in YouTube and come back. Because remember, the PowerPoint alone isn't the lecture. This talky bit isn't the lecture. The lecture also comprises of the activities as well as any external material that we refer to, okay? Excellent, so let's leave Newton's uh, three laws to the side and let's move on to the next topic, that is types of energy, okay? Radio. So the first thing that we need to do is be able to classify the types of energy. Now when we have the cognitive verb of classify, one way, one tool that you can have students display their understanding of the different types of energy is a concept map. Now I'll be using a concept map later on in this lecture to demonstrate how to summarise a video on the fly so you're not constantly pausing the video. But in the meantime, let's look at a traditional static concept map. Now, energy broadly falls into two main categories, kinetic energy and potential energy, okay? So kinetic energy are the, are the types of energy, so it's a category of energy, which is anything which is moving, then we classify it as kinetic energy. Whereas potential energy is energy which is stored and stored in some fashion. So when we have a look at the different types of kinetic energy, we can look at thermal energy or heat energy. So thermal energy is the movement of the molecules and the atoms within, uh, within a mass. Mechanical energy, that is the, the energy of actual motion. So a lot of times when we're referring to kinetic energy, we're actually referring to mechanical energy. So it's unfortunate that we use those two terms interchangeably. So what I'd like to recommend to you is that we reserve kinetic energy, kinetic, for the class of uh, types of energy involved in energy of movement and the actual movement of the object we uh, use mechanical energy for. Then there's the energy where electrons are moving, and so that's, uh, that's how we have um, electric energy, and then magnetic energy is kind of related-ish, kind of, to um, electrical energy, um, and that's where you, you get uh, ma um, magnetic objects um, causing motion. 
Okay, so let's have a look at potential energy. These are in, uh, forms of energy where energy is stored. So in potential energy, we've got chemical energy. So the reason why we eat food is because the molecules within those food, within their bonds and the motion of the, the molecules actually store energy that way. And our cells through our mitochondria and glycolysis release that energy so we can actually use it. Elastic energy, so things in which are elastic, an elastic band, for example, can also store energy. So when you stretch it, you're putting energy into the system, and when you release it, energy is being released, obviously. Okay? Nuclear energy is the type of energy stored in uh, atoms and subatomic particles and their interactions. And gravitational potential is, is the type of energy which is stored uh, depending upon how close two objects are. So for example, um, here on Earth, the closer we are to Earth, the less gravitational potential we have, and the further we move away from the Earth's surface, the more gravitational potential energy that we have. Okay? So they are the broad types of energy. So let's see how, oh, there are actually two more. <laughs> so we've also got sound energy and light energy. So light energy is kind of, kind of related to electrical energy and magnetic energy in terms of they're all phenomena to do with the electromagnetic field. And sound energy is also kind of like kinetic energy, uh, mechanical energy, in that sound energy is, is the vibration of molecules passing on that vibration through a chain so that that energy travels from one location to another location, okay? So they are the broad types of energy that we pretty much learn in our high school. So have a go at matching up different types of energy with the real world examples, okay? So you can draw lines, you can get into the PowerPoint and you can draw the lines in there, you can print them out, draw the lines by hand, it's really up to you, okay? So pause the video, complete that activity and if there's a follow-up session in your course then and you have any questions, then you're more than welcome to raise those at that lecture. Okay? Excellent, okay, so let's move on to the year 10 topic, which is of energy transfers and transformations, okay? Because according to the law of energy conservation, um, energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred and transformed. So here we have an example of an energy chain. Okay, so an energy chain is, is really a, a system where energy gets transferred or transformed from one form into another. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk through this energy chain, but what you're more likely going to ask your own students to do is to actually draw out that energy chain. Okay, so let's have a look at this one. So the primary energy in this example is coal, and that is um, energy stored millions and millions of years ago, solar energy in fact, and it's stored in chemical form. So plants, millions of years ago, took that solar energy and converted that into chemical energy which is stored in its bonds. That got buried millions of years later, we humans came along and dug that coal up. Okay, so we grab that coal energy and we burn it. That burning of the coal releases thermal energy. So this is all happening within the power station. That release of thermal energy heats up water, okay? So it's still thermal energy, and then that steam turns a turbine. So it gets converted into kinetic energy. As that turbine spins, it's actually spinning either a magnet in a coil or a coil around a magnet, and so thereby that kinetic energy is being converted into electrical energy. That electrical energy makes its way down the, the power lines, through the meter, so this is the, the delivering part, and it finally reaches the kettle. So it goes, from, um, it goes from electrical energy, and it goes through the wire, through the element. As it passes through the element, there's a huge amount of resistance in the heating coil in that kettle, and it gets converted back into thermal energy. 
that thermal energy is then passed onto the water and then into the coffee cup. Okay. Now, what I just did was is explain that energy chain through energy transfers and transformations in a verbal format. What I'd like you to do is to rewind the tape, rewind the tape, go back to the beginning of this explanation and see if you can take my verbal explanation and turn it into a flow diagram. Now you don't have to draw pretty pictures like they do here, but you just might want to draw words and draw arrows to connect those words. So that's what we mean by a flow diagram. So an energy chain is a type of flow diagram. So that's one example of an energy chain. So to give you, oopsie, to give you some practice at drawing energy chains, what I'd like you to do is to draw the energy chain for this scenario. So start with the water. Don't go all the way back to the water in the clouds. Um, start with the water in the dam and then as it flows through the control gate. Okay, so what kind of processes, uh, what kind of energy transfers and transformations occur in the system to get it to the power lines? So there's another example. Here's another example, okay, for you to have a go. So here, what I'd like you to do is, there's a person there in green who's playing the piano. But don't just start with playing the piano. Go back, imagine that that person in green has just eaten an apple. Okay, so go from the chemical energy stored in that apple all the way through to the scientist, the dude with the glasses there, uh, to him hearing. Now don't go all the way through to the brain and all the electrical happening in the brain as, as the sound registers, but just to the point of those sound waves hitting his um, ear. Okie dokie. Excellent. Radio. so here is another activity for you to help wrap your head around some material. Now, here the learning objectives compare and contrast Newtonian and Einstein conceptions of gravity. So one is a video on Newton's ideas on gravity. The other one is Einstein's uh, views on gravity. What I'd like you to do is to compare and contrast that. Now, my go-to tool is the uh, is the Venn diagram. Now you can also free to use the double bubble map to actually map these out. So obviously here you're looking for similarities and differences. So go ahead, watch these two videos and summarize those two videos in this format. So you're actually processing the information at that higher order thinking level. Okie dokie. Now, so hopefully you've done that activity. Now, one of the things about gravity, it's kind of hard for us to actually wrap our heads around, okay? So what we have here are two videos. Now, the pointer is not working, but the video on the uh, left there, okay, is, is, the, is one of the ways that we actually think about um, Einsteinian gravity in that objects with mass, objects with mass, Objects, matter, warps space. So you can see there a planet, and the best way to think about, well, not the best way, I think, but one of the ways that we traditionally think about warping of space-time is, is a bowling ball in the middle of a trampoline, as you can see there. And so that, uh, that grey ball that you can see there, it would actually orbit the planet by running around on the trampoline mat um, uh, along a geodesic line, okay? Now, that's okay, but it's slight, uh, there, there are a few issues with it. A more accurate way of thinking how objects warp uh, 3D space is that other representation that you can see here. So rather than thinking about a flat space as a flat sheet with the grid, drawn on the flat sheet. Think of space as a box of air with a three-dimensional grid that you can actually see. So rather than an object sitting on top of a mat, what an object actually does is it, 
is it crimps or squishes in space so that you can see there, whoopsie, right there, that would represent the very middle of the planet where the gravitational field is the strongest. So as you move towards the center of the, that uh, spot there, as you move towards the surface of the Earth and go into, uh, into a planet, the, the, scrimp, the, the squishing of space. So if you imagine that someone has reached their hand into this grid box and kind of grabbed it and squished and squished and squished. And so it's drawn a whole heap of lines in. So it actually ends up looking like, uh, like this, as opposed to uh, that scenario over there. So these are both videos on YouTube. So please do pause the videos, go and watch them so you can see the difference in terms of representation of how we think about Einsteinian gravity and the warping of space-time. The last topic I'd like you to do, and this is where I'm actually going to demonstrate how to live concept map. Okay. Now, the very last um, learning objective, no, sorry, the very last content descriptor in year 10 is talking about uh, laws that describe motion. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a look at uh, this learning objective, describing Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. And he had three of them, as the name suggests. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this using the pedagogical strategy of explicit instruction. Now, this is going to be a topic of a, of a future video. But for now, all you need to know is that there are three main phases. I do where I demonstrate the skill. We do where we do the skill together. And then you do where you do the you demonstrate the skill independently. OK, now to do this, we need to jump out of here and go into the video. So I'm just going to minimize the PowerPoint and come into here. OK, so what we have is the video over here on the right. And we've got this is my go to my uh, concept mapping uh, online tool. OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play this out now. I'm not sure whether the sound will actually come through, but that's not that that's by the by. What I want you to demonstrate to you is how you can summarize on the fly without stopping and pausing all the time when you're watching video. OK, radio. So I'm just going to replay this video. Hopefully you can hear the sound. So that it makes sense. In 1609, Johannes Kepler published Astronomia Ooh, yes, Nova, we are. a book containing 10 years of his efforts to understand the orbit of the planet Mars. He was using state-of-the-art astronomical observations from his mentor and employer, Tycho Brahe, who was famous for generating an enormous amount of high-quality data. And he needed to find the best explanation for the motions of Mars, a very tricky problem. There were three models of the solar system out there at the time, but none of them worked very well for Mars. First, the Ptolemaic system put the Earth at the center, with the Sun and planets orbiting it in perfect circles. There was also Copernicus's heliocentric model, which set the Earth among the planets revolving around the Sun. And finally, Tycho had his own system to propose, which combined aspects of both. He put the Earth at the center with the Sun and Moon orbiting it, but let the other planets orbit the Sun. Okay. All three systems relied upon circular orbits because a circle was accepted as an ideal shape. Copernicus, Tycho, and Galileo all believed that planets should travel along circular paths, but the data just didn't fit. Instead, Kepler found that another shape, the ellipse, works a lot better. An ellipse is sort of like a flattened circle, and it has some special properties. You can draw one by taking a loose string, attaching both ends to the paper, and using a pencil to keep the string taut while moving all the way around the perimeter. The result is an ellipse. The length of the string never changed, meaning that the sum of the distances between each endpoint or focus and any point on the ellipse is constant. 
In Astronomia Nova, Kepler states that Mars travels in an elliptical orbit around the Sun, which is at one of the foci of the orbit. Later on, he expanded this first law to include all of the planets and demonstrated that this shape fit the available observations. The further apart the two foci are, the longer and skinnier the ellipse. And this skinniness parameter is called eccentricity. Comets can have very eccentric orbits, coming in quite close to the Sun before traveling back to the outer reaches of the solar system. On the other hand, in a perfect circle, the two foci would lie right on top of each other, right at the center. The orbits of the planets in our solar system are not very eccentric at all. They're really very close to circular, which is partly why perfectly round orbits seem like a natural thing to expect in the first place. It wasn't easy to abandon a central idea like that, but with his first law of planetary motion, Kepler rejected circular orbits and showed that an ellipse could better explain the observed motions of Mars. Generalized to all planets, it states that the orbit of a planet follows an ellipse with the Sun at one focus. Okay, excellent. So, and I'll just zoom out. So, what you are, have just seen is a demonstration of how you can use concept mapping to summarize a piece of text, a piece of multimodal text on the fly. Okay, so obviously what I would do for this concept map is then watch the next video on the second law and concept map again and then also then do the same for Kepler's third law. Okay, excellent. So, there's a demonstration. So in the explicit instruction pedagogical model, I've just gone through the first stage, which is I do. And then what we would do next is we would do it together. So we'd watch the video and I would call for you to, to give me suggestions on what I should write. And then the last phase of that is where you students are working independently and summarizing the text yourselves. Okay, so a concept map is definitely one way that you can summarize information, but another way that you can summarize is by a T chart. Now, I'm going to call them T charts in this course, but in the real world, people are more than likely going to call this thing a table. So, whether you call it a table or a T chart, that's really up to you, but it's going to be one of your go to tools apart from concept mapping when it comes to um, summarizing information when you're asking students to describe. So in this video, we've covered the topics of Newton's three laws of motion. We've then used those three laws to explain phenomena in terms of those predict, observe, explains that we did earlier. We looked at different types of energy. We've classified, we've given examples of those different types of energy. And then we've looked at uh, energy chains by describing tr energy transfers and transformations. Then what you did was that you watched two videos, one on Newtonian and the other one on Einsteinian gravity, and you completed either a Venn diagram or a double bubble map on that particular topic. And then lastly, I demonstrated how to summarize a multimodal text using a concept map um, of three, uh, Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Thank you.